Bare metal emulation is a fantastic way of getting even closer to the original computer experience. And with the possibility of building up a replica machine using original hardware, it really can't be beaten. So let me show you how to get set up and started with the ZX Bare emulator. Hi and welcome to Bytes and Bits. Emulation is a great way of experiencing retro computers such as the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. But having to boot up into Windows or Linux and then into your emulator, it can isolate you from the experience or the true experience of using one of these machines as it, as, as it was originally built. So in this video, um, I'm going to show you a better way of getting closer to the real experience and we're going to use something called a bare metal emulator. Uh, and this will eventually lead us towards being able to actually take a, an old ZX Spectrum. So this, this is just a keyboard and case. There's no actual motherboard inside this one. But we can then use our bare metal emulator, which will be running on a Raspberry Pi. And we can turn this case and keyboard then into a replica ZX Spectrum, which will pretty much feel and behave exactly as the original machine. So let's first of all have a look at what a bare metal emulator is and how we can then use that to get us closer to the real experience. So if we start looking at something like our Raspberry Pi, so the actual circuit board itself contains our microprocessor, but that's also connected to a number of peripheral devices such as our display driver, our USB, our SD card and, and so on. So we need a, a certain base layer of software that allows us to control these devices. And this is where our BIOS comes in. So our BIOS is usually stored as uh, some sort of firmware, some sort of um, flash uh, memory or something, which is immediately available to the microprocessor once we turn on. So once the BIOS is up and running, that gives the microprocessor access to our SD card, where it can start to load in some sort of software. Now usually that software is an operating system such as Linux and that will then load into our system and that then will take over the operation of our computer. And after that then we can start to load in our applications which could be our emulator itself. And then on top of that our emulator will then load in the software that allows it to turn itself into something like our ZX Spectrum. So our sort of software stack tends to contain these different layers. And the biggest and bulkiest of those, of course, is our operating system, because that has to cover basically everything we want to do with our computer. So in bare metal emulation, what we try to do is to take out this big bulky block of software, the OS, and simply run our emulator software directly on, well, well effectively our hardware, because our, our circuit board and the accompanying firmware in our BIOS, we can sort of treat that as the basic level of as low as you can possibly get. So by doing this, our bare metal emulator will simply allow us to boot up directly into our emulator. And then on top of that, we can then start to run our ZX Spectrum software. So the upshot of this bare metal configuration is that once we power on our Raspberry Pi, we will almost instantly boot into the ZX Spectrum interface. And that makes it feel almost identical to the original hardware. So to get this project up and running, we're going to need some pieces of equipment to build up our little mini retro computer. Now in this video, I'm going to be using modern keyboards and so on, really to get the system up and running so that we can see it working and booting up as a ZX Spectrum. Putting the system inside a real ZX Spectrum case and keyboard, I'm going to reserve that then for a follow-up video because it really does need a video by itself. So please do make sure you subscribe to the channel so you don't miss that next episode when it comes out. So for our keyboard, we need to use a USB device. So either a wired keyboard or as I'm using here, a wireless one that uses a USB dongle. So remember, we don't have our operating system, so we don't have our Bluetooth drivers. So we need to use one that actually plugs in and we can drive them directly through the BIOS using our emulator. And similarly, if you want to emulate joysticks, then you'll need to plug in a USB gamepad. 
Now the main component of course in this project is our Raspberry Pi itself. So the emulator that we're going to use will work with any Pi model uh, up to the Raspberry Pi 3, but also then the Pi 0 and the Pi 0 2. So in this video, I'll be using the Pi 02W, as that will be the one that I eventually take through and put inside my ZX Spectrum keyboard and case. Uh, but obviously, th the setup that we go through here is identical for any of the models. And as I say, um, you'll, you'll get good performance out of all of the models, um, especially the Pi 3 and the, this Pi 02W. To complete our setup then, we need a display and some sort of sound output. So I'm going to use this little 11 inch um, HDMI monitor. And that really for me helps mimic the idea of having a portable TV sitting here with my ZX Spectrum, just like it would have been back in 1980s. Now the display I've got here is one from Elicro and it's their Crowvision display. Uh, and this is a really good one for this type of job because on the back of it, you can actually mount your Raspberry Pi in there. So actually, um, for this particular setup at the moment you see on screen, I have a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus set in there. And that's all being powered and driven from the display itself. So if I just power on, you'll see that I boot straight up into my ZX Spectrum. And we have a very neat little computer system now sitting on my desktop. And if you're interested in getting hold of one of these displays or, or, or something similar, then please do have a look in the description down below where I'll put some links out to this sort of product. So with our hardware sorted out now, we just need to get hold of an emulator. So if you head across to this web address, and again, I'll put links to that down in the description, you'll come to the web page for the ZX Bare emulator. And of course, this is our bare metal ZX Spectrum emulator. So on the web page, you'll find lots of information about the features of the emulator and, and, it's, and it's sort of what it supports and what its limitations are. So again, this is an emulator that will allow you to emulate um, the, the, the original 48K Spectrum, the 128K and the plus 2A. It does run on only a certain uh, number of Pi models. So basically the original Pi version two and version three up to the 3B plus and also the Pi zero. And on, although the Pi zero to W isn't listed here, it is actually supported and has got some um, specific files for that in the download that we're going to see in a second. Now the Pi 4 and the Pi 5 are not supported and I don't think the developer has any plans on updating it to support those. Uh, but again, they are a bit of an overkill for this project. So if we scroll down a bit um, on this page, you'll eventually come to the download section. And there are a number of files that we do need to get hold of. Now, I, I would advise you download all of these files just so you have them all um, ready for use. Um, so you can then pick out the ones that you need. So just simply click on the link and then, of course, just download that um, to your hard drive somewhere. Now, the way these files work are that we have an all files file. Uh, and when we unzip that, that will contain all of the files we need to build up our um, ZX emulator. Now the other files here are, are individually um, prepared files for various models of our Raspberry Pi. Um, and again, that's very much based on the version of the ARM chip that's embedded into those devices. So you can see here we have our ARM version 6, ARM version 7 and ARM version 8. And you can see there it lists out which particular models that relates to. But my, my advice would be to download all of these and now we're going to work on actually assembling our SD card to get this installed. So I have downloaded all of the files here and I've also then extracted the files out of the all file zip file, which we can see here. And if I open up that, you can see that there are a, a range of different files in there um, which are going to help us build up our SD card. Now, as regards our SD card, uh, the Bear emulator just simply needs a blank FAT32 formatted card. We don't need to actually burn an image onto it or create any boot sectors or anything on that. So if you have an SD card available, do make sure that you come in and that you format that. 
and make sure you format it as an FAT32 um, drive. And again, I've, I've just given it a volume label so I can see which, which uh, what's on this drive. Uh, so just make sure you format that uh, and okay everything there. Now, if you have been using that SD card for in your Raspberry Pi beforehand, you'll probably find there are a number of partitions on that. So you do need to properly clean it before we can use it as, as our boot drive in this particular project. Now, um, if you use the Raspberry Pi imager, there is a clean SD card option within that. Um, or please do have a look at one of my previous videos, and I'll put a link to that in the description down below, which shows you how to remo remove any of these Linux partitions to get you back to a, a totally clean um, SD card. But once we have our clean SD card, then this all files uh, folder, so remember this is the extracted files out of that all files.zip we downloaded. We just need to copy all of those files across onto our um, SD card. So if I copy those and just simply paste them in here. Now, ideally, this should now be everything ready and set up to work. Um, I think the the emulator is supposed to boot up and work out what model of Pi it's running on and then select the correct files for that model and, and boot up. Now that did work for me with a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus, but my Raspberry Pi 02W, um, it, it, it didn't do it correctly, it just doesn't boot up at all. So that, that made me think that perhaps the file selection thing isn't quite working as it should do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through how we can minimize the files on here and basically force our ZX Bear emulator to choose the files which are specifically created for the model that we're going to use. So if we have a look at the files on our SD card, you'll see that there's a whole range in that folder. So the ones at the top here, the, these .dtb files, th these are device tree files uh, and they really are there to describe the hardware setup. And you'll see that there is a specific file then for each of the Raspberry Pi models right up to our 3B Plus and our Pi 02W. So, so, so these files are used by the um, the, the operating system, if you want to call it that, um, to allow it to fine tune itself to communicate correctly with the Raspberry Pi hardware. So it is important that we have this in place. Now, obviously, at the moment, there are lots of them in there, and, and perhaps this was where the, the software was going wrong and not selecting the correct DTB file. Um, so again, we're, we're going to trim that down a bit. The other files then are the, the, the kernel itself, that's the actual emulator software, or, or the emulator software is embedded within that file. We then have a couple of other files here. So our, our boot code, our, our fixup.dat and our start.elf, these are to do with a, a very minimalistic operating system that is used by the emulator to run within. So, so again, um, having to write absolutely everything from scratch is a mammoth task. So the although this is a bare metal emulator, um, it does use a very small operating system just to do a lot of the base hardware um, interaction for us. So, so in effect, it, it, you can think of it as, as running on the bare metal. It, it is down at that level. So we need to keep those files in place. Of course, then the actual kernel image which contains our emulator, as we saw on the website, these are specifically tailored to the various ARM versions. So again, we're going to choose the one here that matches in with what we want. So really, the choices we have are as to which image we keep and which DTB file we keep. So I'm using a Raspberry Pi 02W, so I'm going to get rid of all of the other DTB files that are not the ones that I need. OK, so again, you, you fine tune it down to the one that you're going to use. The Raspberry Pi 2W uses an ARM version 8. It's the same as the Raspberry Pi 3. So we don't need those files there. And this now gives us our, our tuned 
installation for our ZX Bear emulator. So when it boots up, it will only find the image for our version 8 ARM chip, and it will only find the device tree descriptor then for our Raspberry Pi 2W. Uh, and this is how I managed then to get the 2W up and running. So we've got the actual emulator software all in place now. Of course, that's going to need some games. So again, all we need to do here is we just simply need to create a new folder. I'm going to call that games. And then I'm simply going to copy across some uh, ZX Spectrum games. So these need to be in TZX or TAP files. So these are the, in effect, the file uh, images of the cassette tapes. So if I copy those, come into my games folder and paste them in there, we should now be ready to power up our bare metal emulator. So if we drop our SD card into our Raspberry Pi and then power on, we should find that we boot up into our ZX Spectrum. And there we are, onto the normal ZX Spectrum start screen. Now from here, obviously, we need to learn how to use our emulator. Uh, so we, we really are now sitting as if we were in front of a real ZX Spectrum. We need to, if we want to play a game, we're going to need to put a tape into the tape recorder. So we do that using the F1 key. And that brings up the main sort of emulator menu. And there's a number of things that we can do inside here, but one of them is that we can go and find some tapes. So if we come down to the games folder, which we created before, so I'm using my cursor keys, the space key selects that. I can then come down to um, a game file. I can then press space to select that. Now what that has done is actually put the tape into the tape drive. It's not going to actually start it for us. So again, it's as if we are sitting in front of our actual computer. So we do need to type the load command. Now, if you're not familiar with the ZX Spectrum, uh, the keys on the keyboard are used to select various keywords. If you want to find out what they are, if we use the Alt key plus K, that brings up a, a help menu here. So that is an actual image of the ZX Spectrum keyboard. And you'll see that there are each individual key has a number of functions attached to it. And, and you do need to get to, to, to grips with how the ZX Spectrum works as to which buttons you need to press to get which of those keyboard options. Um, but what we, we need to use load and then the inverted commas. So load is on the J key uh, as a keyword and the inverted commas are on the P key as a shifted key. Um, so again, again, you will have to just get used to how the, how the ZX Spectrum works for this. So if I press Control K again, that gets rid of that. So if I press J, that brings up the load command. And then if I do on the keyboard, it has to be Control plus P to get the red options. We can type in load and then press enter. And you can see that the emulator now is, is emulating the software being loaded in from our tape drive. It, it does run the tape drive a lot faster than normal, but it does let you go through this um, sort of um, these horizontal colored lines of our loading sequence. And any of the loading screens that you would get in various games, they will all pop up as normal here. But eventually then we will end up in the actual game itself. And there we are, Manic, Manic Miner has loaded up. And at this point, we are ready to play the game as normal. Now, if you look at the screen, um, you'll see that I, I'm running it here on a, on, on, a, obviously on, a, on a video capture device. So I'm, I'm running it at a full HD resolution um, HDMI input. And you can see that it's not, it's not quite filling the screen vertically. Um, and it's probably not quite set up just as I want it. So we're going to look at a few settings on how we can do that and what you might want to um, set up, depending on what sort of monitor that you're running this on. So I've taken the SD card out of the Raspberry Pi and put it back in my computer. And we're going to have a look then at the contents of that. So there is a file in there called config.txt, and this is the standard Raspberry Pi uh, settings file, if you want to call it that. 
Now, the, the actual contents of this are actually detailed in the Raspberry Pi documentation. So if we go across to there uh, and into the page here, so, so the config.txt, if, if you just simply search for Raspberry Pi config.txt, and you'll, you'll, you'll have this page pop up in your search results. Now, this file itself was changed um, at the launch of the Raspberry Pi 4. So the Raspberry Pi 4 uses slightly different settings to the Raspberry Pi 3 and the Pi 02W. So on the side menu here, you, you, you really want to sort of scroll down until you get to the legacy config.txt options and go across to that. And there you'll find the settings which we're going to be dealing with. And we're going to be working with the video settings in that. So if I go across here, you'll see that we now are in the legacy video options. So we're going to use this file to help us understand what um, settings we need to, to make. So if we go across and actually edit that file then, and I'll bring it up in here, you can see that there are a number of settings that we can possibly sort of set. So as we go down through it then, so the first one here, this HDMI safe mode. Uh, the safe mode basically puts the Raspberry Pi into the lowest common denominator for an HDMI signal. So if, if you do plug everything together and you're not getting anything coming up on your HDMI monitor, then setting this to one should work or at least give you some image. It might not be the correct one, but at least it will prove that you actually are getting a signal coming out. And if you, if you set this to one and it still doesn't work, then um, well, I'm not quite sure what you do then, to be honest. Um, you'll have to do some, some extra deeper digging to find out exactly what specific settings you need for your, your display. But um, th 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 I've, I've never seen that happen. So coming down to the next setting then, our overscan. So whenever we powered up um, on my screen, you saw that there was a black border top and bottom of the screen, as well as left and right. Now that is to do with the overscan settings on the monitor. So, but by default, the Raspberry Pi will turn overscan on, and that sort of helps you center and size your um, active pixel area on your screen. So obviously mine um, isn't set correctly. What I'm gonna do here is I'm actually gonna disable my overscan, and, and that should get rid of the borders, and my display should be able to work out for itself how to set itself up. So, so if I turn that off, we should lose the black borders, at least top and bottom. Obviously, the left and right black borders are to do with the aspect ratio. So, so the ZX Spectrum screen is a, a, a squarer aspect ratio than our, our sort of widescreen monitors these days. So, so you are going to get borders left and right on, unless we stretch the screen out, which will make it look raw, wrong. Um, so so we'll, have to, we'll have to just sort of have to put up with those. So underneath that, um, if you do need to leave Overscan turned on, but it's not quite the right settings, you can, of course, change the borders um, with the settings down below it. Next, we have the frame buffer size. So as you can see, by default, it's going to look at your display's size and then size itself from that. So usually we don't have to do anything with that. Um, but as we're going to see in a little bit, as I set up for my Elecro display, um, we do need to edit that in certain circumstances. The next line then um, our force hot plug. So again, this is where we can get the display to detect what it's being um, displayed on, or we can just simply say to it, um, you will be plugged into HDMI, so set yourself up for that. So I'm gonna force mine to be an HDMI display. Next, we need to set up, or, or we can set up the HDMI group and mode settings. Um, so again, all, all the details for this are detailed out in the actual Raspberry Pi documentation. So if you go to HDMI group, you'll see here there are three different groups. Uh, and usually we will be, well, well the default is the auto detect. Um, so this EDID is our display telling the Raspberry Pi what it's capable of and the Raspberry Pi will then match with that. Or we can then force it into a mode. So we have here the, the CEA tends to be the HDMI modes and the DMT tends to be the DVI modes. Um, so again, you'll, you'll see them all listed out here. Uh, and really what you would do is you would say, okay, I want to be um, HDMI group one, and then you'd pick a mode which sort of matches in with your display. Um, but again, leaving it as zero for now, and um, we can then rely on our monitor telling us what to do. So I'm just going to leave that as it is for now. Then coming down underneath that, um, we have this HDMI drive. And this is where um, 
are our monitor can be plugged into HDMI or DVI, and DVI tends not to have sound associated with it. So if it does try and um, drive itself in DVI mode, then we'll lose the sound. So we're going to force it into HDMI mode here, and that will just make sure that the um, audio signals are sent out with the, with the video signals. We then come down to our signal boost. So by default, um, th this is the, uh, in effect, the, I suppose, the power that's being sent out on the HDMI signal. Uh, so if you are having problems with the signal sort of dropping out now and again, um, then you can increase the signal boost um, to try and sort of um, remedy that. So by default, it has certain values it's set to. Um, but if you are perhaps using a very long cable or perhaps your display just needs a bigger, a, a more, more powerful signal, then you can up this value. And I think the maximum value is 11. After that then, there are a few other settings which we're not really going to look at because um, they're sort of to do with um, how you set up the um, overclocking and so on. And again, the, the Raspberry Pi is more than powerful enough to run our emulator at full speed without any overclocking. Now, as I said before, on, as we're going through here, um, I am sending sound out over my HDMI channel because uh, both my, my normal monitor and my Elecro monitor both have speakers built into them. Now, if you don't, then obviously um, you'll need to make sure that you send your signal out um, over your um, the headphone output or if you're using the Raspberry Pi Zero version, then you will have to sort of work out that um, on the GPIO pins. Uh, but I'm not going to cover that in this video. I'm just going to assume that you will be plugging into a sound capable monitor. So, so really all, all we've done at the moment in here is we've just forced it into HDMI mode, forced the sound to come out and turned off our overscan. So let's have a look and see if that gets it set up for us. So just make sure I save that and then we'll plug it back into our Raspberry Pi. So the SD card's back in the Raspberry Pi and we'll just power up. And there we have it coming up, booting into our ZX Spectrum. And there we have a nice display on the screen. And if I jump into the um, menu, we can see there that everything is up and running. And we now have it filling the vertical space in our display. But also then, because of course it's the four by three display, it's, it's giving us the, the proper size text um, inside our ZX Spectrum area, so it's not it's not stretched or distorted. Uh, but of course, we then do have the uh, bits of borders either side. But that then is everything up and running and ready to go. So if we plug everything back into the Elecro monitor, powering on again, we boot up straight into our ZX Spectrum, and we now have a. A, a replica ZX Spectrum. Okay, we have a modern keyboard which doesn't have all the markings on it, but we are now sat in front of effectively a ZX Spectrum. And again, the nice little display just gives it that feel of being that small monitor sitting there in your bedroom with your brand new ZX Spectrum. So I hope you've enjoyed that. Um, this is a really good project if you um, do enjoy using your retro computers. And again, um, taking this the next step then, as you can see in the background, my um, actual original ZX Spectrum Plus, putting all of this then inside that and replacing the modern keyboard with a real ZX Spectrum, that really is the next step to get us right up to a, a proper replica machine. I'll be covering that in one of the next videos. Um, so do please make sure that you subscribe to the channel. If you've enjoyed this video, do please like it, and that'll make sure that you get connected up and you don't miss any of the next episodes. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you do have a go at building up your own replica machine. So have fun, and I look forward to seeing you again very soon. And bye for now. For more games programming, electronics projects, and retro gaming, please make sure you like this video, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and visit my website.